Hi, time sure flies by when you're having fun, and talking about 1999's games sure is. And I've so many more of them to cover. Today though, let us laser focus together on another 10. Planescape Torment is a cold classic top-down RPG, made with improved iteration of the Infinity Engine used in years prior to Baldur's Gate. It takes place in the Planescape multiverse and places you in the shoes of the so-called Nameless One, an immortal man who forgets everything if slash when killed. The plot is very story-heavy, putting it on a definite forefront of your adventure, showering you with detailed descriptions of all locations, characters and objects present in the game, and serving a very immersive and extensive dialogue system. Combat encounters, while not absent, are definitely more sporadic than in most other RPGs of the time, highlighting the switch Black Isle made with this one, refocusing their attention from extensive combat into solving most of the quests, puzzles and situations with dialogue and player's choices, rather than blatant spells. In in fact, grand majority of the scripted combat sequences can be avoided by either picking correct dialogue options or by use of the stealth system. The story circles around the immortal Nameless One traveling the city of Sigil and other planes trying to put the puzzles of his lost memories together and to figure out why he was made to be an immortal. Interestingly enough, since his memories reset when he's killed, many of the characters that he'll meet both these that can join his party and those that are just NPCs have met him before and often have their own opinions about him already. Party members will frequently talk between each other or even join conversations our protagonist will have with other NPCs. And it will happen all throughout the adventure, adding a lot to both the atmosphere and story, which while perhaps slowly unfolding, is rather good and worth experiencing. You start the game as a true neutral fighter, but will be able to change your class into a thief or wizard eventually, and your alignment will naturally evolve throughout the game in response to the choices and actions that you'll take. Planescape Torment puts you behind the steering wheel of the adventure, allowing you to make all of the most important decisions in the game yourself. It features only a few scripted events outside of your control, and in the process, as you're taking its world in, making all the choices, you will now not only learn about our hero, but hopefully about yourself too. There's not many things as good as bacon, Planescape Torment is one of them. Like good, salty, crispy fried bacon. Yum. Before Sega's Football Manager monopolized the genre, destroying all of its competition with unprecedented simulation accuracy, deep and involving gameplay, unparalleled detail of its data and groundbreaking realism, we had many games tackling the subject. One of them was Ultimate Soccer Manager 9899 the series that were my favorite before Sega. USM, that came out in 1999, could be best described as football simulation with a heart for those who are into the whole idea of running your own football team with all that it entails, but are also not willing to train Excel sheet reading through most of the gameplay, getting lost in hundreds of tables of numbers and endless data. Nope, USM lets you do everything any other manager does, so scout, purchase and sell players, deal with the advertisers, train your squad, change team tactics, schedule matches, play in the league and international competitions, everything. The big difference being, it's not overbearing you with data, but only presenting all the info that you need at any given moment in the most attractive way possible, to make it easier to enjoy the fantasy. A super fun and nicely animated, at least for the time, match engine was nothing to scoff at either, and made observing all those games and making tactical changes on the spot more attractive than they would have been otherwise. USM came with seven European leagues of England, Scotland, Italy, France, Germany, Spain and Netherlands included, so over 400 clubs with close to 12,000 individual players. The best in my opinion feature of it though would have to be the built-in editor that not only allowed you to create your own players but also entire teams. So you're not wrong in assuming that naturally I used to make teams made out of my friends and then assigned skills and positions to them depending on how much I liked them. Best buddies were strikers and attacking midfielders with superstar skill levels, those less close manned the defense or filled in other spots, and those I did not care much for were warming up the benches for the infield players. If you like football management, USM is a no-brainer, as it's a very easy and enjoyable game to get into even today. My boss's wife is the craziest driver that I've known. I mean, the odd two or three times I've stupidly agreed to get in a car with her, it was as if the Jesus took the wheel and she was there just to witness it. I'm sorry, naturally I meant the devil, she'd not let the enemy drive. No traffic rules or signs apply to her and she knows the only two states when in the car, either full stop or pedal to the metal 
all out full speed cutting through the traffic at breakneck speeds and sliding between other cars putting no attention to the oncoming traffic always on her phone. It's eye opening, you know, the experience I mean, as when in the car with her you quickly realize what are the most important things and people in your life, making a mental list of who you miss and what you lose dying. And when you're finding out somehow, miraculously, you're ready to let them know how you feel, cause you just went through an unnecessary near death experience. Funny thing is, she's been in what feels like dozens of accidents bigger and small, she's had numerous traffic violations and tickets and yet she'd never faced any consequences or lost her license. Anyway, Driver, our today's game, more or less depicts what being in a vehicle with her feels like but adds story. Cause you know, a game about half demon half lizard from Europe driving cars would have made for an odd title. So you play as John Tanner, an undercover cop who is sent into the heart of the crime syndicate posing as a getaway driver to investigate their activities and eventually in order to break open a big case against them. Driver is a third-person action-adventure driving game set in four big and open cities of Miami, San Francisco, Los Angeles and New York. And as you gather your evidence, it will put you through several very unique and hella fun missions. So you'll do tons of odd jobs for the mob, uncovering assassination plot of the president and eventually potential police and FBI's involvement in it. There's also a bounty fifth city of Newcastle, England unlockable, but it's not really a part of the main story. Other than the plot missions, there's plenty of additional bonus activities, which are mostly daredevil worthy or destructive endeavors. You know, stuff my boss's wife would do unknowingly anyway, going from point A to point B doing 180s, donuts and reverse spins to name a few. All that aside, what Driver really was to all of us when it came out, was an incredibly fun and chuck full of action and tricks game that everyone I knew played, be it on PlayStation or PC. No one likes to be made aware of their shortcomings, especially those that deny having any. I don't either. But at least when it comes to gaming, I am full aware of mine. It's RTSs, Souls likes, Versus Fighters, Flight Combat and Hardcore Racing Simulations and, well, Arena slash Competitive FPSs. And it's no news to me. I've known it for at least as long as I knew that I don't appreciate it being shot on by birds flying over. So for years. And believe it or not, it happened more than once, probably closer to 10 than 5 times overall. Such is my luck. Anyway, since what I wanted to say here I've already managed to unnecessarily convolute as usual, let me explain. I suck at arena shooters and Unreal Tournament is one. It doesn't mean that I've not played it, just that I'm not very good at it. UT was made from ground up for online play only. I mean sure, it could be played with bots too, but where's fun in that? So I'm electing to ignore that mode entirely. And when it comes to online, what Epic did was near genius. They've simplified the matchmaking of online games to the absolute basic and made it enjoyable for everyone, even those who had no idea about networking or servers or pings or any other internet goblins. You just pick internet game option out of the menu and are near instantly presented with a list of hosts sorted by the game type and ping. And from then onward, you just gotta click on the game you'd like to play and are spawned in to carry on hunting noobs till you tire yourself out or keep being sniped and debugged if you're me. Naturally, all the staple game modes of deathmatch, team deathmatch, capture the flag, domination, last man standing in assault and their variants are present and as fun as they ever were. In fact, Unreal Tournament is not only playable to this very day, but also still liked by the players all over. Mainly for its speed, ultra precise controls, tons upon tons of fun and smartly designed levels and fair assortment of weapons. Nearly all of them having two firing modes. Short of the mini nukes shooting redeemer, but it didn't really need any extras to be terrifying. For both user and the potential victims. It had to be used at appropriately long distance as its blast radius annihilates anyone in range. Friend or foe. If you're a fan of competitive shooters, especially those that are really, really fast, then Unreal Tournament may be worth a look, even today. Disciples is a turn-based strategy RPG mixture, which for all intents and purposes, looks and feels a little like Heroes of Might and Magic mixed with Warlords. It's built on an identical trifecta of screens for mentioned heroes are, so the main adventure map, upon which you're exploring the land, visiting locations and engaging in combat, then there are close-up combat screens, in which two of the opposing forces always clash. Sometimes in combat, less often and usually in my head only, in dance battles showing off their sick moves. And finally, the city view, where you recruit units, construct buildings and research spells. If you've played Heroes, you'll feel right at home in Disciples is what I'm saying. There's four races to pick between, the Empire, so humans, the Mountain Clans, which are either dwarves or mountain goats, and only one of these is not true, the Legions of the Damned, so demons, and last but not least, the Undead Hordes. 
which are precisely that and need no extra explanation. Each of these has their own unique looks, cities and units, and these units can be upgraded to their more powerful or useful forms, if appropriate structures are erected in the capital, that is. Interestingly enough, Disciples use front and back row mechanic in combat, meaning some units can be assigned to just one of these, and these locations actually matter, as different units have different attack patterns and some may only target particular rows or creatures in them. It's a novel and interesting concept that's fun to play around with, but it's also a little disappointing, because while in combat, units can't move at all, and just keep attacking from where they stand. To some degree, the fact that both heroes and units get better and improve their abilities with experience redeems Disciples, but while I always liked it and enjoyed my time in it and its successors, I don't think that it ever rose to the quality of Heroes of Might and Magic offered, and especially not in the hot seat multiplayer. It was more of an interesting, less polished but feature-packed sidestep than the evolution of the genre. Either way, it's a well put together strategy and time playing it will definitely not be or feel wasted. Carnivores 2, despite its setting, is actually a first-person perspective sci-fi hunting simulation. You know, like Deer Hunter, but with much less deer and tons upon tons, quite literally I must add, of dinosaurs. Big and small. It takes place in the future where interstellar travel is nothing extraordinary and we've been doing it for a while, zooming around the space like the intergalactic bosses that we are. Well, you're definitely one, I'm more of a funky sidekick, you know, the dude that keeps commenting on what's happening all around, hitting fun and cringe with these comments equally as often. So we, humans, were seeking planets to settle on or hunt, which kinda makes us the human equivalent of the Predator. Remember the movies? Anyway, we finally found a suitable location, there's this distant watery planet that looks eerily similar to how Earth did millions of years ago, and it's chock full of dinosaurs living their best dinosaur lives on it. You know, eating grass or each other, just waiting for an asteroid to come down in a fiery blaze and kill them all. But before it does, there's you, and you went there to hunt them on a series of islands that they live on. You're armed with a pistol, crossbow, sniper rifle, map, binoculars and a dinosaur whistle. Cause yeah, in the future, there's a whistle that can be used to call dinosaurs. And you're left to your own devices to hunt as many of them as you'd like. If you ever doubled in real deer hunting, or same titled game for that matter too, you'll feel in carnivores too, right at home. Meaning you'll have to approach them carefully as they're observant and have excellent hearing. You'll do it silently, often staying in the downwind to hide your cigarette scent, you know? Do you smoke? I often imagine you smoking. And you'll do it smarter rather than hard. Wow, that sounds really, really, really weird. Anyway, there's nine different dinos to go after, from the Parasaurolophus to the uber-aggressive T-Rex, and while some may run away when hunted and not killed in a single shot, others will straight up attack you. Some alone, others in groups. Either way, it's not what you want to ever happen. The biomes are rather diverse and include forests, jungles and swamps, and successful hunts reward you credits, which then can be spent on better weapons and more demanding hunts. All the hunting games, I feel, are for a very specific type of a gamer. One that hunts in real life and enjoys it and has plenty enough patience to approach the task methodically and with smarts. Carnivores 2 is not a typical shooter and shouldn't be played like it. Personally, I'm not the kind of a gamer, but objectively speaking, Carnivores 2 is interesting if you're into its subgenre. Revolt is a radio-controlled cars racing game and the best title in its subgenre since the classic Micro Machines. I loved Revolt when it came out and I played it to death, alone and with a buddy of mine having the time of our lives. It's hard to put the finger to what exactly made it so special and truth be told, I can do it even today. So when you exclude what's impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. The conclusion that I came to being that it had to be a combination of things. Revolt sported beautiful high resolution and high color graphics, it supported all the popular at the time graphic accelerators too and ran super smooth, serving as close to real life RC experience as it was possible. The cars were fast, but they never, not for a second even, felt like real ones. They were made to be radio controlled and they acted like it. It was great. Even better, there were over 28 different ones and each felt, looked and drove in a unique to it way. So, unlocking them all was really fun and rewarding. Tracks too, all 13 of them were fantastic and covered a wide spectrum of locales that you'd find in and around the city or your local neighborhood. From backyards, through museums and construction sites, to supermarkets and luxury liners and everything in between. They're all ultra detailed, well designed and simply put, a blast to speed around on. If that all wasn't enough, there were naturally weapons too, stuff you'd find in popular kart races like the one with moustached plumber, so missiles, stars freezing the opponents or lightning bolts shocking opposing cars among others. 
Revolt truly was an incredible sum of its parts, and while all day alone might have been just good, when put together, they made this amazing little racer that was more fun than it had any right to be. To complement it all, it also featured many different game modes. And while the single race, championship, time trial and practice are self-explanatory, they were also three that are not so obvious. Stunt Arena was built out of loops, ramps, halfpipes and other obstacles that held 20 stars to collect. Why would you want to collect them at all? Well, to telegraph your superiority over your friends who couldn't and also because they are used to unlock stuff. BattleTag was a multiplayer exclusive mode which had a star hidden within it. When one of the players found it, a timer started counting down and for whomever the countdown got to zero first, won. And the last was, well, last. And finally Clockwork Carnage, which is just an amazing name, allowed you to race in a 30 car strong wind up car races as opposed to the standard 8 car RC competitions. Revolt is great, and if you don't know it, make sure to check it out, it's worth it. Worms Armageddon is a turn based squad tactics party bonanza mayhem like no other. Also, a standalone expansion to the earlier Worms 2. In my personal opinion, the best iteration of the game to date. Though it has to be said that I was one of the seven people in the world who actually enjoyed Worms 3D when it came out a few years later. Nobody else did though, and I didn't know the other six folks, so the game died from natural causes of abandonment. Rest in peace. Interestingly enough, while being released in 1999, Worms Armageddon is the only outing in the series still being periodically updated on PC, with the last update taking place in the mid-2020. If you somehow never played Worms, any of them really, and this is your first time hearing about it, then first of all, what happened? Are you okay? Do you need help? Let me know. And secondly, you're in for a lot of fun. And if you manage to find someone, at least one person to play it against, you can easily multiply that expected fun tenfold. In essence, Worms, any, not just this one, is an artillery type of a game, so you know, one where there was a tank on each side of the screen and each of the players tried to destroy the opponent first. All naturally in turns. But Worms is also that very simple formula, taken to the extreme, polished and packed so tightly with features that they're overflowing. So, you have distractible environments, which can be open singular islands set on the seabed, multiple smaller islands, whole screens and compassing cavern systems, and everything in between. What's more, they are randomly generated before each match, come in one of the dozen of teams, each of featuring numerous decorative objects. Worms themselves can move, in fact they can walk around for as long as they want to, all around the map, as long as there's still time left and they haven't taken a shot. A shot always ends the turn. So they can walk, jump, use ninja rope to swing over large distances or to be used to reach hard to get to places, they can drill tunnels and even teleport, if appropriate skill is accessible to them at the moment. All that, you could find the best place to park yourself in, then shower the enemies with fiery rain of banana bombs or other means of death and destruction and observe the results laughing maniacally. Or just to hide outside of the opponent's reach to focus on your other worms to take the offensive in their hands. Cause yeah, naturally, being as anthropomorphic as they are, they do have hands. Weapons are another huge step up over the original and are a collection of dozens of different tools of pain and misery. From simple uses, bazookas and homing missiles, through holy hand grenades, airstrikes and forementioned banana bombs, all the way to old grandma's super ship and the likes. Variety is not something that Worms is in short supply of. There's plenty of tools too. They're not deadly, but sure are useful. So stuff like girders, teleports, bungee and ninja ropes, and parachutes and torches to name a few. You have the setting, you have the worms, tools and weapons, so what's the gameplay like since it's so different than that of artillery? Well, worms, despite being turn-based, is fast. Really fast, in fact. The game lasts until there's only one of up to four teams standing, regardless if it's a whole team or a single worm with a single HP point left keeping him alive, and the goal is to kill all the enemies and survive. Typical turn gives you between 30 to 90 seconds and the whole round lasts around 5 to 15 minutes. When the round time runs out, the game enters the so-called sudden death mode and each and every turn, water level rises, adding to the challenge and making you want to dispose of the opponent's ASAP, while simultaneously holding onto the lives of your slimy wards as if there was no tomorrow. There's hardly any game, and I don't mean in 1999 only, that would be as fun in multiplayer as Worms are, and Armageddon is the ultimate entry in the franchise. If you've someone to play games with, challenge them in Worms. It's easily an evening of fun, if not more. Age of Wonders is another of those nearly but not really heroes of might and magic games. 
It's inspired by wood famous disciples are, but takes its own approach with the formula, coming out being a rather fun and innovative experience, but no better than the original was. Though nothing is really, so it's not a surprise. Age of Wonders is a turn-based fantasy team strategy with tactical combat. It features 12 unique races of elves, lizardmen, so you know, race my boss's wife comes from, humans, goblins, dark elves, undead, orcs, dwarves, halflings, frostlings, azraks, whatever these are, and the highmen and in multiplayer, over the internet or in hot seat mode, all 12 can be controlled by players, which made it a hero's game for the larger groups of friends to enjoy together. Now, would I recommend playing a game such as this one in hot seat by 12 people at once? No, never, because it's just stupid. Not only the game would take a long while to start rolling, as all players would have to wait long for their initial actions, but also the more time you would spend at it, the more noticeable and annoying the wait would become, as you'll have more and more to do with each passing turn. And so will your opponents for that matter. Over the internet and using the simultaneous turns option, it's naturally all fine and dandy. As compared to Heroes of Might and Magic, resources have been simplified, and are now only gold and mana first, used to recruit heroes, build units, cities and upgrade them all, and second, to research and then cast spells. Units can also be recruited from wandering the map armies if they decide to join your forces, that is. Cause yeah, in Age of Wonders, units can freely move around the map and are not stationary, but all of them, be it found randomly or hired in cities, require upkeep in gold every single turn. They gain experience too, and with it medals, silver and gold respectively. With each of these medals received, their base stats get a small bump up. Heroes level up as well, but instead of just 2 medals, they gain levels, with a maximum one being the 30th. And unlike regular units, they don't get bit better automatically, but you get a certain number of skill points that can be used to improve their parameters or teach them special abilities. Spells that can be casted by heroes only are divided into one of 8 groups of life, death, air, earth, fire, water, cosmos and chaos. That last being the offshoot of the evil magic that spawned my boss's wife into existence in a dark and bloody sacrifice ritual aiming to eventually destroy the multiverse. She's still in her first form, but the transformation is inevitable and sooner or later she will doom us all. Combat is turn-based and takes place on separate screens and naturally skills and abilities of all units play a crucial role in it. Learning them all is a must for successful and stressless progress. It's worth noting that the results of combat encounters can also be instantly simulated, but personally, I wouldn't like to skip one of the most fun parts of the game. That said, I see it being useful in those large, 12-player strong games. The campaign is composed out of 22 consecutive missions slash maps and tells a tale of humans coming to a new land and destabilizing the balance and peace between the other 11 races living there already, eventually leading them to an all-out war. You know, how we do in real life. Age of Wonders is really fun, especially with two free others playing with you, but mainly if you approach it as its own thing and don't do what I did and search for similarities to Heroes of Might and Magic, as nothing in the subgenre was as good at the time. 1999's Windows port of Raptor Call of the Shadows is basically the very same DOS game that originally came out in 1994, but running on Windows and not shareware anymore. The end. Don't you just love being able to say everything that there is to say about the game in one solid sentence? I did, and now we know all that there is to know, and we can carry on with our day. I was planning on checking out Hellblade 2 more, and now I have time. Great. Also, it's not gonna happen, as I can't just leave you out there hanging and wondering if I finally lost it. So, Raptor Call of the Shadows is a vertically scrolling shoot em up and one of the best games in the genre on PC. It is divided into three large chunks called Sectors, Bravo Sector, Tango Sector and Outer Regions respectively, which funny enough were separate episodes in the original shareware release. And each of these sectors is split into 9 smaller sections called Waves for a total of 27 levels. And while you can start the game in any of these sectors, it's advisable to take them in order, as that way it's easier to accumulate money, weapon and shield upgrades. While the first Bravo sector is very generic feeling, looking like a copycat clone of any random shoot em up from the early 90s, both Tango Sector and Outer Regions are very unique, with their wave slash levels being thematically interesting and considerably varying. First featuring distinctive locations of the sectors, a chemical plant, farmland, jungle, city, airbase and the likes, Outer Regions on the other hand sees you traveling to nearby planets, each of them uniquely designed too. Also, can we agree that calling levels waves is just stupid and I'll revert to the more classical naming from now on? Bosses appear at the end of the levels and sometimes, in those longer and more difficult ones, midway through too. They're naturally more demanding and often massive and require learning their attack patterns and memorizing the best way to down them. Repetition, as in most shooters, is a key to success. 
Weapons can be collected or purchased between the levels and fall into one of the two categories. Always active, that fire continuously when you keep the fire key pressed, and selectable, that you can switch between to pick and match them to the challenges and bosses ahead. And only one of these can be used at a time. It's worth pointing out that while most weapons are universal, there are those two that can only hit ground or air targets. So it's good to learn the differences between them and optimal use case scenarios. Kinda like I did with my boss's wife. You look at her when she talks to you, sometimes not, or even send a passing and fake smile her demonic way, all the while making sure that all the words that come in also immediately come out and that you don't save up any of them in your local brain storage. It's just trash, not worth keeping. And there's a lot of it too. There are also a few kinds of shields in Raptor, each working in their own unique way, and an ion scanner, which displays bosses' energy and damage meters, and a mega bomb, which I feel is a wasted opportunity, as Omega Bomb is a better name. It clears the screen of all the enemies and their projectiles. Well, it doesn't one kill bosses, but damages them considerably. You can have a maximum of five of these at once. Raptor looks, sounds, and plays great, so if you enjoy shoot em ups, it's a must have. Would you agree that 1999 is turning up to be a blast of a year? Well, let me know in the comments below. If you like the video, hit those like and subscribe buttons below. And maybe share it too, it helps more than you know. If you didn't, then don't naturally. It was fun talking to you as usual, and I'll see you, or more accurately, talk to you very soon.